Hello and welcome back to Perspectives, bringing you our daily dose of news and views we hope are relevant to you. In today's show, we have coverage of the Kalistan referendum in New Zealand and a shocking example of Hindutva propaganda attempting to whip up the country's right-wing extremists to turn on law-abiding Sikhs during the event. The UK's Prime Minister meets Justin Trudeau in Brazil and they both meet Modi. Will sparks fly? And speaking of Modi, his billionaire best mate Gautam Adani has just been indicted in the US for bribery and corruption. Often linked to the Indian Prime Minister himself, could this be the very thing that finally brings down Modi? Well, all this and more in today's show. And joining me, as always, for Perspectives is our very own correspondent in Canada, James Casano. Good morning, James. Good morning, Angus, and good morning to our amazing viewers. Thanks once again for joining us. Indeed. And James and I together will be bringing you our perspectives on that daily news affecting the Sikh community across the world. And of course, as always, we'll be taking a look at loads of your great comments which have been pouring in by the bucketful beneath our videos. So thank you as always for those. Right, James, a lot to get through today. Uh, what are you going to start us off with this morning? It seems like the, uh, the proverbial fan is still spinning with all of the crap hitting it, and it's flying right in Modi's direction. The U.S. has still got Indian nationals in their crosshairs, and they are now going after Mr. Adani, a multi-billionaire who happens to also be a very close friend of Narendra Modi. Now, the opposition in India has taken the information on the latest uh, indictment that's been issued by the circuit court in New York City against this India billionaire. Now, the opposition, as I was saying, has wasted no time in linking Narendra Modi to this billionaire and calling their bromance a very long and tr uh, troublesome one when it comes to the fact that they think Modi's been protecting this billionaire for years. Now, the accusations coming out of the U.S. are that the Indian uh, billionaire, Mr. Adani, has actually been facing a lot of scrutiny when it comes to the India stock market and trades that they have made by using offshore companies and breaching the regulations there in India. But now it's gone much further in a quarter of a billion dollars, yes, $250 million bribery and extortion scandal where they have forced various political members within India to play along with false documents, falsified records, and other things when it came to the SEC regulations and filings in the United States to get them on the public markets there. Now, at this time, as again, as I said, the U.S. Circuit Court has issued an indictment and an arrest warrant. And this is really just another in the long line of fights and, and uh, shots that are going towards India. Now, it's very interesting that even though uh, Mr. Biden or President Biden was trying to get Justin Trudeau and Narendra Modi closer together for a picture op today. Uh, it is not a friendly situation when it comes to the U.S. and India. The political field has been going on for decades about this connection between Gautam Adani and, uh, and the opposition is saying that it is fraud, it is corruption, and it helped him to make over $25 billion in profits over the last several years. And they are calling for the Congress is calling, sorry, for a JCP investigation into the Modani scams. And they're calling and Modani scams uh, crossing between the two, Mo, uh, Modi and Adani. So it's very interesting to see how that's looking. We'll have to wait and see what's going to take place because, again, whether or not he will be extradited to the United States to face these charges and whether or not Modi's going to make it through this uh, another scandal on the international stage, I don't know because it seems like the international community just continues to laugh at Modi as he keeps getting his hands caught in the cookie jar and this is where it might end for his political career angus what are your thoughts well clearly modi is under attack from all sides on the international stage i mean we talk a lot i mean obviously we've been focusing on the transnational repression situation 
and his uh, essentially his, his involvement in that. But now it does look like, and a lot of his critics have actually raised this whole issue uh, about the fact that he is uh, deeply connected with Gautam Adani. And again, we have touched in the past quite a lot about his connections with his billionaire mates. Of course, power and money are very, very uh, comfortable bedfellows, aren't they? And um, of course, uh, these allegations have been raised in the past that Modi has... Uh, I think I would euphemistically put, uh, has helped uh, Adani win all sorts of contracts. Now, Adani um, himself is, is in a lot of trouble. I mean, basically, he has been caught by the SEC the, uh, in, the, in the US, the regulatory uh, authority in the US looking into this. He's basically been caught red-handed um, and undertaking quite a, quite a, I mean, what's a large scale. Again, that's, that's an understatement. This is an enormous scale fraud. And basically, he has fraudulently got investors to invest in, I, I gather, solar farms, uh, but under the basis that his firm, he, he publicly declared that his company had um, a huge uh, array of policies, anti-bribery and corruption policies, compliance policies, which is pretty standard for any, any international company, and indeed, in fact, any national company. Certainly here in the West, it is expected under normal corporate compliance and corporate governance that you will have a raft of, of compliance policies, which includes anti-bribery and corruption. In fact, by, by law, you have to have these policies. And of course, his company has alleged or supposedly got these policies, but he lied. And it turns out that there is evidence of a massive uh, bribery uh, thing going on with, with the Modi government, uh, as, as we talked about, 250 million, at the, possibly at the very minimum. Uh, yeah. to enable, to facilitate uh, certain contracts, of course. And, of course, investors are saying, hang on a second, uh, we didn't know this. We were, <laughs> we were advised that your company had, uh, had in place all these compliance policies. Well, it turns out they didn't, and they've basically been fraudulent, uh, allegedly so. So, uh, yeah, I think, is this the thing? I mean, ironically, after all the criminal activity that Modi's government have been involved in, in terms of transnational oppression, how ironic that the final thing that might bring him down is something like this. It's something commercial. It's something about corruption. I mean, we all talk about corruption in India, but, ah, oh, the irony, if this is what finally brings him down, I think, it, I mean, great in terms of uh, for the Sikh community. But ultimately, he's just another puppet of the RSS and the Brahmin. So unfortunately, it, it, there is a danger that he would be replaced by somebody equally as dangerous for the Sikh community. Time will tell. But yes, James, I think this is a very, very important story. Um, and I think we're going to have to follow this one closely. And in fact, we will touch upon this in one of my podcasts potentially tomorrow. So keep, um, uh, keep uh, glued to the channel for a podcast with Dr. Sandy, where I think we're going to cover this one as well. Um, but yes, James, I think this is a fascinating one and we'll have to keep following this very closely. Absolutely, Angus. And as you can see on the screen there, of course, Canada comes up somewhere in this investigation. And uh, there are links to a Canadian investment, uh, institutional investors uh, involved in this. So we'll have to watch and see if Modi tries to push it off as another Canadian narrative to sully his beautiful reputation. <laughs> So we'll have to see how that plays out. But speaking of the gap between Canada and India, well, it's gotten a little wider when it comes to your flight time going from Canada to any destination within India. The Canadian uh, security for air travel has come out and said that there is now a requirement for passengers to show up at Canadian airports a minimum of four hours before their flight starts boarding. And this has got to do with the temporary increase of the security checks of all individuals flying to India. Now, we haven't heard of any direct correlation to threats or any intelligence that uh, CSIS or other agencies of the Five Eyes have brought forward, but it's interesting how it just out of, at this time, has come that they're saying that it's out of an abundance of caution that they are increasing the security checks of every passenger. And that is exactly what they have said, uh, the federal uh, Minister for Transport, Anita Anand, has said that the decision is, as I said, an abundance of caution, and Transport Canada has implemented temporary additional screening measures. But there's no timeline as to when this is going to end, and whether or not, again, there was any credible or chatter of a threat against Canadian Airlines. And of course, we all know that uh, with the uh, 
with the investigation into Air India 182 going back to 1985, there was a major breakdown in many security checks and balances that were in place. And of course, those were pre-9-11, so they were a lot different than they are today. But at the same time, there was a breakdown that led to the ability of that terrorist activity and the worst air disaster in Canadian history. Now, this again, with all of the transnational repression and all of the current uh, foreign interference, people are once again calling for that inquiry to be reopened into the uh, re those responsible parties of the Air India Flight 182 investigation because there is a lot of information out there that may not have been available at the time due to it being classified and also because certain investigation teams were informed to not look at the India government or India intelligence as a part of the overall investigation. So again, we're really watching as to why and how long this new heightened security level is going to be in place going from Vancouver, again, or sorry, any Canadian airport to India. So again, if you are traveling anywhere from Canada, add an extra four hours to your travel time just to check in at the airport. Angus, I don't know that any other country is following suit. We haven't heard of uh, any increased screening in the U.S. or uh, I haven't heard of anything from the U.K. So far, it seems to be only Canada. Yeah, um, I've, I've certainly heard nothing over here in Europe or here in the U.K. I think this is uh, maybe uh, just specific to Canada. But I think it highlights the, the tensions and the sensitivities in Canada over this whole issue. Because, of course, the Air India bombing um, sits very, very painfully in the uh, emotional history of, of Canada and, of course, the, the Indian diaspora. Um, I think, uh, I mean, wow, four hours. It's I mean, just my eyes water the prospect of having to fly out of Canada with that sort of weight. It's, it's pretty frightening. Um, but I think there is a very serious uh, thing behind all this because, of course, yeah, the Canadian authorities have to take absolutely every every security measure just to prevent any atrocity occurring. And we've seen coming from Hindutva, um, I mean, they, we, we've seen what they're capable of and what they're capable of is actually quite right. frightening. Um, you know, we talk about the Air India bombing and, and there's still, there is an awful lot of evidence emerging that Hindutva, well, let's, let's, whatever you want to call it, but certainly the Indian uh, intelligence agencies may well have had a hand in that bombing. Certainly the Sikh community are strongly believe that that bombing uh, stem from an operation by Indian intelligence. So if they've done yeah. it in the past, one then it does raise the question, are they capable of doing it again? Of all times, now actually would be a very, very good time for them to orchestrate a similar sort of atrocity and again blame it on the six. Now, I mean, it, it, it would be the ultimate act of desperation, but frankly, after murdering people like Najjar and attempting to murder Panoon, etc. I mean, those on the face of it, I mean, who, who would have thought India would have been capable of doing that? Well, they were and they did it. They tried it. Uh, so it's only a short step in, into another uh, terrorist atrocity on a mass scale, another, another um, aircraft bombing. Who knows? They could be capable of it. So I think the Canadian authorities have taken the, uh, the right action now to, uh, yeah, take air on, uh, air on the cautious side, uh, but I think the other the other slant to this story is, again, it just highlights this divisive agenda coming from India. And that uh, it's interesting that, that the turn of phrase in your article there, James, was um, it was labelling or it was identifying both the Sikh diaspora and the general Indian diaspora as potential uh, targets of terrorism. Yeah, this is what it's all about. It is actually even ordinary Hindus are targets. They are the collateral damage, as Panoon effectively implied. Even the Hindu population living in Canada could be the collateral damage of this divisive agenda. In other words, everybody's a loser with Hindutva ideology, even Hindus themselves without them even realising it. So, yeah, James, I think there's an awful lot to this story. Interesting that Canadian authorities are stamping down on this so, uh, so firmly. Yeah, and we'll definitely keep, uh, keep a lookout on that. And, of course, with uh, the Canadian holiday season approaching next month, we'll keep an eye on whether or not that uh, continues throughout that season because it's going to be a real crunch on the airport staff and security uh, to try and add all of these extra layers. But at the same time, it's going to be very important to do so. 
Indeed, absolutely. Okay, well, let's um, let's continue on the Modi theme, James. And I, I just want to quickly just cover, if I may, um, something over in your neck of the woods that came out yesterday. Yeah. Um, just quick coverage. The Globe and Mail. Um, I, 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 traditionally, I would say the Globe and Mail seems to be a bit more of a Modi and Hindu of a supporter. Um, one one has to question their own agenda uh, and a potential RSS infiltration there, or certainly an influence. But actually, interesting, they came out with an article uh, in recent days actually admitting that Canada's security, CSIS, suspect Modi knew of the plot to kill uh, Hardeep Singh Najjar. And this article um, actually goes into great details um, and it does reiterate a lot of the, the information that we do know already. But they do actually acknowledge that CSIS uh, were potentially aware that this plot to uh, to murder Najjar and, of course, linked to the plot to assassinate uh, Gopatran Singh Panin in New, New York that uh, the, the US Department of Justice are pursuing, that this plot, this operation, uh, clearly stemmed from RAW, the, uh, the intelligence agency in India, the research and analysis. But, of course, by extension, uh, Ajit Doval, the former head of RAW, obviously knew about it, as, as did Amit Shah, um, the Home Minister in India, and therefore, by implication, Narendra Modi. Now, there is no proof, and, and the Global, uh, Global Mail admit there is no proof to this, but they do say that CSIS do strongly believe, through their own connections with CSIS and, uh, CSIS and their own sources, they do strongly believe that Modi knew about this, and that is at the very least uh, that he knew about it. And if he knew about it, therefore, by, by uh, acquiescence, he, he approved of the operation. So again, no proof. But clearly, if CSIS suspects it, then there is a very high probability that Modi did know about this, and therefore, by implication, he approved of this operation. Um, it's massive in terms of its implications. This implies that a prime minister approved of assassination of a foreign citizen on a foreign sovereign territory. I think this is a big story, James. Um, but it, again, all it does, it just, it just reiterates everything that we've been talking about, really, in the last few months. Absolutely, it does. And it's interesting because with this story, of course, the uh, Hindutva media has been still siding with Modi. But later in the day, when the story came out about Modi and Adani there, they actually turned a bit against Modi. And it was very interesting to see how the Hindustan Times actually, uh, you know, is really coming out on the side of the political uh, opponents there. So, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how this story here picks, le picks up legs and whether or not the, uh, the, the Indian media continues to support Modi or if we start, start to see them breaking away from that. And I think that, that is something that we'll have to uh, follow very closely because uh, it may well be that the Godi media, as, as it's known, who, who obviously have been these massive cheerleaders for the Modi BJP government, yeah. once they sense that yeah. Modi's falling, uh, they will reach a tipping point where they realise, OK, he's yesterday's man, and they will be looking for the uh, uh, whoever the, the puppet masters, the uh, Hindutva puppet masters put in his place. And then, of course, that allegiance will switch That's to supporting right. his, right. his successor. So we will watch for that tipping point. Maybe this uh, Gautam Adani uh, story could could be the thing that hastens that tipping point. Interesting times, James. OK, um, let's uh, let's move to the southern hemisphere now. And uh, we talked uh, about the New Zealand referendum, the uh, the Sikhs for Justice organised referendum. Well done to the Sikhs for Justice team for organising a fabulous event that occurred down in Auckland uh, over the weekend. Now, a lot of a lot of information has come back from this. And uh, one, of my, uh, one of my guests for our podcast this week will be uh, Dr. Bakshi Sandhu, who attended. He, uh, he was actually, he's a former, uh, he's a co-founder of Seeks for Justice. And I'll be talking to him uh, probably this evening and that'll be uploaded tomorrow, all being well, about the, uh, the referendum. He was there in attendance and he's uh, he sent through uh, some, uh, lots of information, lots of, uh, of nice videos. And I'm just going to quickly play you. One of the videos um, that he has sent from that uh, from his time in Auckland. I am Dr. Bhakshi Singh Sandhu, President of Council of Khalistan and co-founder of Six Per Justice. I'm very glad to introduce you to our Punjab Referendum Commission Chairman Dan Waters and Member Paul Jacobs. And you're welcome to ask them uh, questions. Sir, please explain. 
Well, you know, as you, as you know, um, the referendum has, uh, votes have been taking place in all over the world. And one thing that the, the community has talked about with the commission is the importance of ensuring that as many uh, Sikhs around the world have the opportunity to participate, which means that we must travel around the world. Uh, the next vote is going to take place in Los Angeles on March the 23rd uh, because there's such a large uh, Sikh community there. The other benefit is uh, it's also the, uh, the home of the Initiative and Referendum Institute at the University of Southern California, which I'm honored to be the chair of. Uh, and we're hopeful that uh, the, um, the uh, Initiative and Referendum Institute will be able to participate in this uh, in some fashion. Uh, but that's the next step, and we uh, look forward to it. Paul? Now we're, we're excited to, to go around the world, but mainly because we see people coming out to vote. And th there are serious problems in this world. The best way to solve them is to get people voting. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Absolutely. Democracy, always the winner in, in these things. Now, those guys were from That's the right. actual official commission who, were, who are, have been brought in by Sikhs for Justice to oversee the process to ensure it follows all normal democratic protocols that any criticisms that will obviously come from India to say, oh, this was unofficial. Well, these guys are there to officiate, to ensure that everything is done absolutely by the book, that there can be no uh, criticisms in terms of the way it was run, that it was overseen by independent observers. That's who those guys are. Now, this event uh, passed uh, peacefully. It was a wonderful event full of happy people, smiling, loads of Khalistan flags, loads of families in attendance. And Dr. Sandy sent me a lovely little video, which I'll, I'll just show you, I'll, I'll play for you now. <laughs> So there you have just a short video of a group of children um, just shouting for Khalistan, uh, which is obviously, uh, I think, just highlights the, the, the whole point that this referendum is a happy, friendly, a democratic process that is involving all sorts of families. There's no, uh, there's no nastiness there. This is, uh, this is the Khalistan movement peaceful, peacefully uh, pushing out their, uh, their democratic right, their democratic voice. Now, all that uh, aside... Um, lo lovely uh, to see all this going on. Now, of course, Hindutva are running scared of what's going on uh, just across many issues that we talked about. And of course, the, we talked a lot about how the Hindutva press are rolling out an absolute tsunami yeah. of uh, anti-Sikh and anti-Khalistan propaganda because they realise uh, that they're losing the narrative. They're losing control of this narrative that the, uh, the, as we keep saying, truth and democracy always prevails, as indeed it will. And they, they're realising they are fighting a losing battle. So um, the stuff that's hitting social media now is getting more and more outrageous, and more and more clever um, in terms of, uh, of them trying to influence uh, the majority of people to try and turn them against uh, this whole Khalistan movement. I'm now going to play you, um, and I have to, again, once again, credit one of our, uh, our viewers, Suki Baines, for sending this link. I didn't find this. Uh, this person, uh, Suki, sent in this, this link. And I want you to watch this video. This, this actually shocked me to the core, seeing this video. Uh, just take a look at this one. The government is with us. That's why they allowed us. This is the government center. A foreign agenda, a divisive ideology, and a confrontation that shook New Zealand's Eodia Square. On November 17th, the pro Kalistan group Seeks for Justice, SFFJ, held yet another so-called referendum, this time on Kiwi soil. But little did they expect a New Zealander would stand tall and unapologetically put them in their place. This video has taken the internet by storm. A proud Kiwi, donning his country's colors, confronted the Kalistani supporters, declaring, Go back to your own country. Don't bring your foreign agenda into my land. His fiery words are echoing far and wide, raising questions about why New Zealand allowed this event in the first place. You think you can come over here and fly this disgusting yellow flag in another country? How dare you? Who do you think you are? The 
so-called referendum saw over 37,000 votes cast as claimed by SFJ. But here's the reality check. This group, banned in India since 2019, is notorious for spreading propaganda and fueling separatist sentiments. And while the New Zealand government reaffirms its commitment to freedom of expression, this incident exposes a deeper issue. Are such activities promoting unity or sowing seeds of discord? The Indian diaspora in New Zealand is outraged. Narendra Bana, president of the New Zealand Indian Central Association, warned of the dangers of foreign influences disturbing the nation's peace. Unity, he says, must be the priority, not these divisive agendas imported from abroad. Even New Zealand's Sikh community is divided. Many local Sikh organizations have distanced themselves from this Khalistan propaganda. The question is clear. If Khalistan lacks support even among Sikhs in New Zealand, who is this referendum truly for? This isn't an isolated incident. Khalistani activities have surged globally, from Canada to Australia and now New Zealand. Remember the diplomatic storm Justin Trudeau sparked with his baseless allegations against India? Are Western nations unknowingly becoming playgrounds for extremist groups? This New Zealander's outburst wasn't just anger. It was a reflection of a nation's frustration with divisive agendas infiltrating their society. His message is loud and clear. You can wave your yellow flags elsewhere, but here the only flag that matters is New Zealand's. So the real question is, how much longer will countries tolerate these foreign agendas cloaked under the guise of freedom of expression? And more importantly, will nations like New Zealand take a stronger stand before it's too late? The clock is ticking and the world is watching. This isn't just about New Zealand. It's about the global fight against propaganda, extremism, and the safeguarding of sovereignty. Will the world wake up or will history repeat itself? Um, wow, I saw that and uh, I just, I went cold watching that thinking, God, is this what the New Zealand right wing think? Is this, is this genuinely what the New Zealand right wing are sort of thinking, how they view the Sikh community, the Khalistan movement? And uh, I mean, the, the first thing I would just say about this video is, is that guy with the megaphone who was there. Um, if he did that in the UK, he would be arrested because actually that he is breaking the law. That is uh, basic, simple racism. The, the, the statements that he was shouting, basically, uh, go back home, you don't belong here, etc., etc. So certainly here in the UK, and I'm, I have no doubt in Canada, he would have been bundled off by the police and arrested for uh, plain and simple racism. There's, there's no ambiguity there. Um, now, so there's a lot of, uh, there was a lot in that video. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have time to unpack it line by line, much as I would wish to, because there's an awful lot we could just tear apart with it. There's a lot of rubbish. But it did, it, it actually shocked me that, um, uh, and, and I think when you go back through this, and the thing that shocked me most of all was it was, it was a very well-spoken voice. It was a very sophisticated video. It implied that this is what, the, uh, what New Zealand thinks, or certainly not as a nation, but certainly the right wing in New Zealand must think. Um, but then I stopped and I started to actually unpack it line by line. I looked at the actual words that were being used and I suddenly, it suddenly dawned on me, it dawned on me and I suddenly thought, hang on a second, there's just an awful lot going on here and a lot of alar alarm bells started ringing. Let me, let me just, I'll just pick out a few things. So little did they expect a New Zealander would stand tall and unapologetically put them in their place. So you've got this right wing thug, this idiot going around with his megaphone. So it's, it implies with this, with this, uh, um, the voiceover is clearly not an Indian. It is a, a New Zealander giving this, uh, this voiceover. And, uh, <clears throat> And this guy uh, running, running down that line with his megaphone, ranting this racist sort of bile that's, that's coming out, saying, you don't belong in my land. I thought, OK, well, that's, um, as I say, apart from the fact it's criminal, it, it's blatant racism, it's, it's pretty extremist. Uh, you think you can come over here and fly that disgusting yellow flag in another country? Your flag ain't welcome in this country. Well, my first immediate reaction to that was, well, this whole, if you understood what this referendum was about, they don't want to be in your country. They're campaigning for their own country <laughs> of Khalistan. Duh, it's not yeah. hard to work out. They want to leave your country and you should be supporting this whole concept of Khalistan because once they win the, the, the Khalistan, they will leave your country. The people you should be worried about as a right-wing thug is actually those who want to stay in your country and impose their Hindutva ideology in your country. But that's, that, but that's beside the point. 
So, um, and then it goes on. The question is clear. If Kalistan clearly lacks support, even among six in New Zealand, who is this referendum truly for? Now, this is where the alarm bell started ringing, saying, well, hang on a second. How do you know that uh, the, 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 the Kalistan movement clearly lacks support even among six in New Zealand? How do you know that? Well, first of all, that's what this referendum is all about. That's how democracy works. We're trying to assess what is the support amongst the diaspora and indeed in the Punjab. What is the level of support? That's what it's all about. And yet you are saying as a fact that the Kalistan movement clearly lacks support. That started raising, hmm, hang on a second. I, I think I'm beginning to see where this is going. Um, remember the diplomatic storm Justin Trudeau sparked with his baseless allegations against India. Again, another red flag, another clue to where this is all coming from. How do you know that Justin Trudeau has baseless allegations? Actually, he doesn't, as all the evidence is pointing out. And then it, go it goes on. New Zealanders' outburst wasn't just anger, it was a reflection of a nation's frustration with the divisive agendas infiltrating their society. And then it goes on, the real question is how much longer will countries tolerate these foreign agendas cloaked under the guise of freedom of expression, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And again, it's all, it's all filtering down, it's all funneling down into this same old, same old uh, rhetoric. Um, and you'll see where I'm going with this. Um, this isn't just about New Zealand, it's about the global fight against propaganda extremism and the safeguarding of sovereignty etc etc so again it all points to the fact that this this all this is highlighting uh, this criticism of Kalistan it's potentially breaking up the sovereignty of India or breaking up the integrity of India now New Zealand yeah. right-wing extremists don't care about the integrity of India who cares about the integrity of India India does so where did this come from? I then started doing a little bit of digging about where this video came from. This video was actually uh, from, um, it was on the website of uh, an outlet called Briefly. Now who is Briefly? This is a description of who Briefly are. From groundbreaking national and international news to the latest automotive trends in India and from across the globe. It's an Indian outlet. This is nothing to do with New Zealand. This isn't even the New Zealand right wing extremist. This whole video is a sophisticated piece of Hindutva propaganda put together by India, put together by the Hindutva machine. All they've done, they've done, they've just recruited a voiceover artist from New Zealand who had no idea about Indian politics. They've got a, a, a video editor to put this emotive music, this really nationalistic, jingoistic music with a New Zealand voiceover artist who's just been paid to read a script. He has no idea what he's speaking about. I've done this in the past. In fact, I'll just cover a slight tangent here. I actually influenced the outcome of the general election of, an, of a small African nation by accident because I was paid as a voiceover artist to read a script which I thought was was part of a film, an independent film. I thought it was fiction. In fact, it was actually used in a propaganda video just like this. I spent years trying to apologize to the people of this African nation to say I was duped. Uh, I, was, I was suckered into reading a script, believing it was nothing. In fact, it actually influenced just like this. It had a real world influence. And this is exactly what's happened. Some poor idiot voiceover artist like me has been paid to read a script and Hindutva have used it and pretended Tended it to be coming from New Zealand, the New Zealand right wing. So, James, I think this is a classic example of how dangerous, because I thought this was like a podcast um, similar to that one that we reviewed the other day in Canada, where this, again, uh, some uh, relatively innocent podcaster was, was duped into uh, regurgitating Hindu propaganda. I thought it was one of those. No, this actually is just plain and simple, straightforward misinformation coming from the Hindutva uh, propaganda machine, James. Very, very dangerous. Absolutely. And you look at the fact that they're glorifying this idiot 
uh, as he's there with his megaphone in the same breath that they're saying that they want to bring unity to their country. And that's, you know, total polar opposites of their own of their own goal. And when you look at them saying that, you know, it's only a small number of, of the Sikh community in New Zealand that supports the Khalistan movement. Well, in 2023, their estimated Sikh population in New Zealand was 50, uh, was about 53,000 people. So you look at those numbers of 37,500 showing up to vote, and that beats out a lot of elections in the Western world for, you know, per capita voters. I mean, exactly. And as you rightly say, almost every single Sikh in, in, in New Zealand turned up to that referendum. So again, That's but true. likewise, it just proves it's the, it's the utter hypocrisy and the irony in that script that it goes on about, oh, we're, we stand against propaganda. And yet this is the ultimate perfect example of propaganda. This is, this is how they operate. They, this is how Hindutva try and turn the tables on the Khalistan movement to saying, oh, the Khalistan Sikh community, they bring out all this propaganda, this dangerous extremist yeah. propaganda, when in reality, and this is what the Nazis did in 1930, in the 1930s, they labelled their political opposition as fascists. Yeah. The irony, of course, being that they were the fascists themselves. And this is exactly what Hindutva and the RSS are doing. The, the, the genuine fascists here again in India, they are trying to label their political opponents as the fascists, when in fact the true fascists are, of course, RSS Hindutva. So, yeah, James, wow. So I, I watched that and turned cold the first time I watched it, saying, wow. But in reality, you dig in uh, into the truth of this, uh, of this story, and it does. This is an absolute beautiful example example of Hindutva propaganda now uh, being spread across the internet. Quite shocking, quite disturbing, quite terrifying, but it does highlight just how dangerous the Indian regime are. Exactly. Okay. And uh, final story, let's move on now as time marches on. I'm going to cover just very briefly um, uh, the G20 summit that's just uh, been occurring uh, over in Brazil. And our own Prime Minister here in the UK, Keir Starmer, uh, was over there meeting Justin Trudeau, uh, your Prime Minister James, and uh, they were seen having a, a, a very jolly get together. Uh, let me, uh, a, a video was actually released of, of the two of them having a, a bit of a, a bit of a shindig together. Let me just play this. It's a, a real pleasure to sit down uh, with Keir to, uh, to talk about the deep friendship between uh, Canada and the UK and uh, how we're going to navigate through a, a, a challenging world. Our focus is and needs to be on uh, how we're making life more affordable, supporting our citizens, but uh, the global context always has impacts on that. We're going to talk about uh, our shared uh, approach, whether it's on Ukraine, on Middle East, on uh, defending democracy protecting the environment, uh, you know, growing our economy in smart ways, both at home and around the world. Lots to talk about, lots of, uh, uh, lots of pleasure at having a great progressive partner uh, on the other side of the Atlantic uh, for Canada, and uh, looking forward to getting into it. Very good to see you again and to spend a bit of time. Um, huge shared history between our countries, um, real opportunities as we go forward, whether that's economy, trade, you know, clean energy, technology, you name it, but also, as you rightly say, um, we live in a volatile world, and there are huge issues, whether that's conflict, uh, the climate challenge, uh, or many others, and it's really good to be talking them through with a true ally um, and a good friend, so thank you for making the time, really appreciate it. I mean, blah, 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 lots of political speak, all the right things. I mean, I could have written the script myself, to be honest. There's, there's nothing sort of <laughs> shattering there. But I think the, the interesting parts there, certainly great body language between the two. I'm certainly no fan of Keir Starmer. Um, and as I say, I'm actually not even a fan of Trudeau. But I have to say, I, I've given Trudeau an awful lot of credit for the things he has, he has done and achieved, particularly for the Sikh community. Um, and uh, but my main sort of I suppose my main target of criticism is, is always Keir Starmer. Uh, great body language, I think. Firstly, um, it's great to see these two getting on because, of course, the, the ties between our two countries are, are deeply uh, entrenched, deeply important, etc., etc. And we are fighting, of course, this uh, uh, the, this evil coming out of India uh, jointly. So it is important that that, uh, that uh, Trudeau and Starmer do see eye to eye. 
Um, but of course, uh, the community here in the UK have been watching this uh, this meeting very closely between uh, the, uh, between Starmer right. and Trudeau, saying, "OK, come on, you've got to be talking about the big topic of the day, which of course is transnational repression." Of course, note that there was no mention of that, absolutely no mention of that whatsoever. Uh, and of course, all eyes are also pointing uh, towards Keir Starmer's meeting with Narendra Modi, which occurred actually just a couple of days ago. And really, we haven't had an awful lot of, uh, of, of news from that meeting, other than uh, there was uh, a few comments from Number 10 Downing Street, the, the home of, of, of Keir Starmer. Because really, what uh, certainly the British Sikh community are interested in, in, in knowing is, well, what did you talk with Modi about? It turns out um, that, uh, well, I'll, 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 just, I'll just read, because of course the, the other big topic is it's not just transnational repression, it's Jagtar Singh Johal, one of the, the biggest issues for the British Sikh community <clears throat> next to transnational repression. You know, did Keir Starmer talk about Jagtar Singh Johal? Um, was that first on the agenda? We would have hoped it would have been. Did he talk about the potential um, uh, assassination of Avatar Singh Kandar uh, at the hands of Indian intelligence? Was that raised? Well, uh, here's, what, uh, here's what the news reported. Britain will restart talks with India on a free trade deal in the new year. Keir Starmer's office said on Monday after this meeting, following a month-long pause in negotiations due to elections in both countries, London will seek a new strategic partnership with India, as well as deepening cooperation in areas like security, education, technology and climate change. Hooray! Great! Fantastic! Starmer's office said after he met his Indian counterpart at the G20. A new trade deal with India will support jobs and prosperity in the UK, Starmer, whose Labour Party was elected to power in July, said. Stunning silence. Uh, you know, that stunning silence says an awful lot from me. Uh, Jagtar Singh Johal, transnational repression. Uh, Avatar Singh Kandar, no, not even mentioned. Um, fine, OK, once again, it's all about trade, it's all about dollar, uh, it's all about uh, security, education, technology, climate change, closer ties, it's all about trade deals. Jagtar Singh Johal, Avtar Singh Kandar, not a mention. No mention at all. Is anything going on behind the scenes? I certainly hope so, because certainly there's no mention of it. The, uh, the Sikh community, the organisations here in the UK, I'm sure will remain optimistic that uh, there is a lot of dialogue going on behind the scenes as part of these, this dealing. I raise a cynical eyebrow. <laughs> we'll judge by results, James. I know what's going on. I'm sure you do too. Absolutely, Angus. And, uh, you know, it's first of all, the body language and the communication between Trudeau and him, I think is uh, very easy to understand. They both had a cold beer in front of them. So that helps to get the conversation going. But at the end of the day, I think Modi's going to quit going to the G20 summits. Last year, he got back from the G20 and Trudeau called him out in the Canadian Parliament. This year, he finishes the G20 and the U.S. Uh, Department of Justice is going after his boyfriend. <laughs> it's not looking I mean, good for him at G20 summits. <laughs> and, and again, as I say, I'm, I'm no fan of Trudeau, but I absolutely applaud Trudeau's stance with Modi. Trudeau has the absolute cojones to stand up to Modi. He's not afraid, yeah. unlike Starmer. He is not afraid to stand up and call Modi out. He has publicly called Modi his government out and it, it, even to the extent where I think there was even a story buzzing around that, that Modi's government wouldn't even let Trudeau's plane land in, in Delhi when he went to visit it, it just out of sheer spite sheer bloody mindedness appalling piece of diplomacy but that is a result because Trudeau has had the guts to stand up to Modi call him out he's, he's actually standing up for the principles of democracy freedom freedom of speech etc uh, much to his, his political da the political damage Damage it's done to him domestically has been enormous, but he stood up for the absolute right principles, unlike Keir Starmer. Keir Starmer is facing a barrage of criticism, even from his own MPs, about firstly his globe trotting. He's, yes, he's, he's on another international sojourn, whilst there's an awful lot of problems domestically here in the UK, which I won't bore you with. But certainly, I, I have to admire the Sikh community's uh, loyalty to the, the current Labour government. But they have to be, they have to remain optimistic. Um, but unfortunately, he is betraying you, as is the British Labour Party, once again, just like the Conservative Party. So my message to the British Sikh community is do not let up. 
keep this lobbying, keep this pressure on Starmer's government, because at the moment, there are no signs that they are representing you. There are no signs that they are going to bring Jaggy home. There are no signs that they're going to launch this investigation they promised into British involvement in 1984 and the atrocity against the Golden Temple. There are no signs that there was going to be an investigation into the killing of Avtar Singh Kandar, etc, etc. So keep that lobbying, keep that pressure up. James, we must never let these politicians fall idle. And that's just it, Angus. They have to be held to account. And the louder the constituents uh, raise their voices, the more they are forced to listen. So, you know, whether or not you are in the UK or if you're in Canada and the US, reach out to our own politicians and say, why aren't you working on behalf or putting pressure on the UK as a partner in the Five Eyes and other security things? Uh, you know, let's put pressure from all aspects on the uh, UK government to get Jaggy home. Absolutely. Grassroots movements really do have an impact, as we've seen. So keep up the good work to the community. OK, James, let's uh, let's move on to our comments. Millions of comments. And unfortunately, we don't have enough time to cover so many great comments that we received. So thank you. And if we haven't covered your comment, don't worry, it has been read and we would have loved to talk about it given more time. But let's have a look at the, um, some of the comments that we have picked out. Uh, Balraj Bra says these are AI videos are going to backfire in India. You mark my words. It's getting more publicity. Uh, when it's getting next level truth will reveal also will include people Canadian white community also etc etc yeah and I, I think you're absolutely right with with a lot of the, the, the points in, the, in this comment these AI videos um, are uh, are proving to uh, that they're being picked out they are being identified as fake uh, and whilst the majority of, of, of the sheep as I, as I often call them do take them at face value people are actually becoming a little more sophisticated they are actually beginning to understand what is AI what is fake so I think um, as, as much as, like that example we've shown already today, as, as, as sophisticated as many of these videos are, I think a, a lot of them now are just relying on cheap AI and they are failing. And I think it is starting to backfire, James. I think people are starting to, to, have, to push back on these. And it's, it's starting to damage a lot of these causes when they're using these rubbish fake videos. Absolutely. And just like that video the other day that we were that a lot of people were commenting on is that, you know, it may not have been AI, but it definitely was uh, taken out of its context and audio edited in. And it's just another way that the uh, that the Godi media is going to continue to try to manipulate. Indeed. Now, a lot of people commented about uh, about that video. Uh, President uh, Q6R and Icon Car, amongst others, pointed out to, they think it is this YouTuber, Indy Jaiswal. Uh, mm -hmm. President believes he's 100% sure that it's him. It recognises his voice. Um, and uh, Icon Car says, uh, it does seem like it's Indy Jaiswal. That's how he speaks. Um, now, I don't know. And I've tried to research this Indy Jaiswal. Unfortunately, most of his videos are in, uh, in Hindi or Punjab, I'm not sure. So I, I can't say. Uh, James and I can't research this because we don't speak his language. So... I don't know. It's up to you guys in our audience to, to tell us. What do you think? Is it this guy? Because I'm getting conflicting comments in, even in, within our own comments. Some people are actually saying, look, this guy is absolutely pro, uh, pro, uh, uh, pro Punjab. He hates Hindutva. He calls out Hindutva, etc. But other people really criticise him. I don't know. It's up to you guys in our audience to make your own, uh, your own mind up about it. Um, because right. I love Punit, whatever, says, thanks for confirming you are anti-Sikh for saying it's Indy Jaiswal. Because you say he's one of the few who calls out India and Hindutva, um, et cetera, et cetera. And even you say you're calling people sheep as a result. I don't know. Um, maybe you in the audience, you guys out there can, uh, can let, let James and I know who is this Indy Jaiswal? Because we can't work it out. It's, uh, yeah, right. it's obviously yeah, too, right. too, 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 uh, too in-depth in the community. It, it goes beyond our, our basic knowledge. So. Um, Alex says, uh, hi Angus, I don't know if you'll read my comment after the show's over, but if you do, uh, please look up uh, this uh, right-wing media in Canada, True North. I don't know, I will. Thank you for this pointer. James, do you know anything about True North? Not a fan. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> I think we'll, uh, they, we'll, they, we'll have a look at this. They have some good stories, Angus, but I just, I, they're a bit uh, over the edge for me on some of their issues and some of their stories, so I just try to steer away from them. 
Yeah, okay. Um thanks all like, for oh, like for pointing that one out. We'll we'll take a look. Um if it's if it's worth reporting on we'll 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 uh, we'll, we'll uh, do something on it. Um, R.S. Rattan says, uh, don't expect nothing but lies from the British government. They look at their own needs only pretend to be everyone's friend. Well, they're politicians after all. What do you expect? The British said loud and clear they could never control India until six are under the hooves of their horses. Six need to understand that we are alone in this. Britain will only do what benefits them. Yeah, I, I couldn't disagree with you. I am absolutely ashamed of the British government. On, on very many occasions, we talk regularly about the British establishment, this betrayal that, that has happened well, since the, since the Sikh Empire was, was beaten by the British Empire, I think we have betrayed Sikhs despite their enormous contribution to the British Army and the British Empire itself, their, their contribution in the world wars, etc. I think, and this is why I am so passionate about the establishment of Khalistan, because I think the British uh, nation is honour bound to support the establishment of Khalistan in recompense for this betrayal. And I would say, please don't label Britain, the people of Britain, with the British establishment. We, the people of Britain, are not the British establishment. The people of Britain wholly support the Sikh community. The Sikh community is integrated magnificently into the British community. They are part of, they are Britain. They are part of Britain and proudly part of Britain. And But they still remain Sikhs as, as a community. And uh, the British establishment doesn't represent me as much as it doesn't represent the British community. So we will always call out the British establishment when it does not stand up for the principles that we stand up for, which is democracy, freedom of speech, freedom of expression, all those wonderful things. And as I said, I strongly believe in Khalistan because we owe it to the Sikh community. As a people, as a British people, we owe it to assist in every way that we can for the establishment of Khalistan. And then, uh, before I get, get back to you, James, I'll just finish this thing about the Brits. Um, the, the Brits yeah. are taking a bit of a bashing in, in some of the comments, and rightly so, I have to say. Um, HC says, uh, UK is a country of shopkeepers. Canada is a rule of law country. And I think this is pointing out, look, in Canada, we follow the rule of law. UK, you're just a nation of shopkeepers. Actually, that's, that goes, it's an old statement that we are indeed, we've been labelled a nation of shopkeepers. Um, I, I don't see that as an insult. It's just a fact. I mean, it's no big deal. But what I would point out about this, please don't fall into this trap of trying to divide Canada and the UK. Uh, Canada and the UK are cousins, brothers, whatever you want to call it. We're all, we all speak the same language, give or take, and uh, we are all friends. Please don't let any wedges be driven between our two nations. We all stand for the same principles. It's India that we need to keep an eye out. No, not India, the Indian government that we need to keep our eyes on. And the final comment here on this is from Jay Singh. British politicians and media houses fall in the 160th rank Indian government credibility category. India was invented by the British, it's a schooling effect. I think the comment basically here is, is, look, India is only a product of the British Empire. Yes, it's the British establishment that handed power over to the Brahmins. That is why they retain control of India. Essentially, they have recolonized India. They follow that colonization. And I totally, I'm with you. It is the British establishment that are to blame for the problems that now exist in India. James, I'm going to hand all this back to you because I'm sure you've got some comments on this. Absolutely. And first, let's uh, let's take a look at uh, at Canada versus the UK. Believe me, if you were in Canada, you would understand that we have our faults, we have our weaknesses, and we've made our mistakes in history. So believe me, we are far from a perfect law and order society. Uh, you know, we do our best, but like the UK, like the US, we all have our faults. Anybody who tells you that their society is perfect is full of crap. <laughs> Now, you know, that's just the way it is. And when you look at that, you look at the difference between the British people and the British establishment. You look at, you know, the Canadian political arena versus what the Canadian people want or, you know, feel. Um, there's a disconnect there. And it's no different than the RSS, the BJP and the Ndutva versus the regular Hindu people. And the Indian people are beautiful people. But, you know, a lot of times they get lumped into one whole package and that's just not fair no matter which culture it is angus indeed and uh, and and I, I think really this this highlights this whole disjoint between the ruling class and the people there's there's been a per perpetual right. disjoint right. and i think it's we the people that always need to keep united 
it is our ruling classes that are the ones that are causing the divisions, that need division to stay in power. That is how they retain control. So we must always stay united. Don't let them drive wedges between all of us. Uh, internationally, I'm speaking as well. And I include the, the people of India in that as well. Right, James, I have a whole page dedicated to, to criticisms and rude comments. I love these, so do keep these coming. Now, Gita Study Group says, wrong, wrong, wrong and nonsense. Oh, really? Well, thank you for your inter intelligent uh, criticism, critique of our show. It would be helpful if you could point out where we are wrong, 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 and then I could answer your comment. And Narendra Kumar goes and escalates it up to another level by saying Angus is full of <coughs> something rude. Well, again, point it out. Thank you for your comment, but it, I can't answer you if you just say I'm full of it, but don't explain why or what I've done wrong. So, yeah. but thank you nonetheless. And uh, oh, here we now. Now we can start answering because you're being more specific. Mitch Andola says, "Stop spreading lies." and cover the Air India bombing. Well, if you were a regular viewer, you would know that James and I regularly talk about the Air India thing. We are in fact demanding that everybody in Canada signs the petition to reopen the investigation to find out what the truth was about that Air India bombing. And the final one, James, before I hand back to you, is Sanjay Shah says, you can tell these two comedians don't believe all they're saying. I love it when we refer to these comedians. It means we still have another the career potentially <laughs> as comedians <laughs> and then uh, so and then we get a bit more seriously and the Khalistan blew up an Air India airline no actually they didn't and this again as I've said is why we're asking for this investigation into the whole thing Khalistan is in Canada regularly promote violence really show us some proof show us the evidence they don't this is the whole point you're just parroting Hindutva propaganda um, the two characters in this show speak a mixture of BS, propaganda, and blindsiding information. And they also throw in a good amount of unfounded conjecture. Right. Um, no, we don't. Um, unfounded conjecture. If we throw in unfounded conjecture, if we ever do, which is very rare, we say, we speculate, we wonder. We're not saying it's backed up by fact. We are speculating because... There's nothing wrong with speculating, but the point is we don't put it out there as fact and say this is fact. We say it might be wrong. We don't know. That is what Hindutva propaganda doesn't know. It spouts misinformation as fact. That's the difference. And likewise, if you think we're speaking a mixture of BS, propaganda, and blindside information, propaganda, we're only countering the propaganda that's coming from India. And no, we don't speak BS. Again, as per I refer the earlier comment, if this is BS, please explain what is BS and provide some evidence so we can counter or talk about it, etc., etc. So thank you for all these critical comments. I love them. We love to debate them. But if you're going to be rude, at least give some evidence that we can talk about and debate and have a bit of banter about, Jay. Excuse me. Absolutely, Angus. And I'll take a moment to address also the Air India comments there. And what people have to understand is that we look at it that regardless as to where a new inquiry leads, no matter where evidence takes us to, we want to know the truth. If it turns out that there were certain individuals that took it upon themselves that happened to be of a sick background or a part of the Khalistan movement, so be it if that's where the evidence goes. But it's just as plausible and just as possible that the India government or intelligence agencies had a big role to play in this than what people believe and that's why it's so important to get to the truth and lay this in this investigation to rest once and for all even the RCMP say that the investigation is still open and ongoing it hasn't been totally solved it hasn't been definitively answered and that's what everybody wants is to get to the bottom of it to get to the truth no matter where the chips may fall you have to keep in mind that back in the day when the IRA was in action, when different groups through around the world, there was violence. It was a different time. It was a different era. But the importance is that we need to get to the truth of history and those historic events so that they're not repeated and it's not, again, something that is forgotten because the victims are what matter at the end of the day of that tragic event. And we owe it to them, no matter what, to get to the truth. 
Well said, James. Absolutely. Harjind says six are targeted because the minor they are a minority in India of only 2%. They don't have representation in a democratic system where 80% vote wins, of course, referring to the Hindu population. Yeah. Six lost to Council Raj, the British, but now lost to Hinduism. Yeah, I mean, this absolutely sums up the problems that, uh, that the Sikhs have in India, particularly in the Punjab. They are a minority voice, as are, of course, the other religious minorities in India, the Muslims and Christians and the Jains. They have no real representation democratically. Um, I mean, proportionately so, they do to some extent, yes. But of course, they are always drowned out by this dominant Hindu force. Now, don't forget that the Indian constitution is supposed to be secular. Unfortunately, the BJP uh, nationalistic agenda is bringing the is bringing bringing religion into the whole political sphere, and this is why it is so wrong. Um, democracy works best when it is effectively secular. Unfortunately, this is not happening in India. The BJP are playing the Hindu card. They played it in every single election, but most importantly, in the last election, they played this Hindu Rashtra. Um, card just to really bring in uh, and encourage the Hindu majority to vote for a Hindu majority party, etc. And that is why the minorities are being drowned out, James. This is where democracy is failing in India. Absolutely. And again, it's just important that uh, that people understand the human rights atrocities that the and the way in which the India government is trying to saturate those areas to take away the voice of the minorities. Yeah, and, and again, I think, and, and then we, we come back onto the British theme again and just and how the Sikhs have been, unfortunately, throughout history, a bit of a, a victim of, of colonialism from first the British and then, and then the Brahmins. Uh, and I love what's it says, uh, yeah, the, the Sikhs were taken advantage of, their faith has been misplaced. Absolutely, that has to keep pointing out. Um, is there a deeper issue? Do Sikhs realise that they are slaves in India and slaves in the UK? I think, um, I mean, OK, dramatically put, but I think it, metaphorically speaking, yes, essentially they are. They do keep being betrayed. And the relationship is as strong as it is today as it was pre-1947. Absolutely. Uh, and Rational Guru says, look, again, points this fact out of how the contribution has been so disproportionately uh, positive from the Sikh community through the world wars, etc. And yet they remain uh, they remain betrayed. And again, Operation Blue Star, how uh, the British were involved in that. Absolutely. And Avatar Singh says, again, refers back to the 84 genocide <clears throat> and the British seems to have forgotten what the Sikhs did in two world wars. Um, and I think you also refer, yeah, you refer to the, the Thatcher um, connection where even the SAS, uh, the British Special Forces, were consulted on, uh, by the Indian government or the Indian military on how to attack uh, the, um, <clears throat> the Golden Temple. Um, et cetera, et cetera. And I think, yeah, all, this, all these comments point to this one uh, common theme is that the British establishment and the English, Indian establishment have worked hand in hand through the colonial era, uh, era through to the, the present day era to essentially suppress the six. The big question is why? We've, we've tried to answer that on, on 100 occasions. But ultimately, all, it, all that we need to focus on is the fact that the Sikh community is constantly betrayed by the British and Indian establishments. And this has to change. And, and the only way it can ever change is through the establishment, James, of Khalistan. I can see no other way of ever resolving this issue. I'd have to agree with you on that, Angus. I think that you've uh, pointed that one 100 percent. And uh, the final set of uh, comments um, was started by Serenity saying, look, all the people on here shouting Khalistan Zindabad, I'd like to ask them, what would you do after this mythical creation of it? It's landlocked. It has no valuable natural resources. Who and what are you going to trade with? It's the least thought out demand that it's on a road to nowhere. Well, I mean, I, 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 I could just jump in here with a hundred different answers to this and I'd just say, look, just, just watch all our podcasts week after week where we answer all these questions, particularly last week's. But actually, RNIJ came up with an absolute pearl of a, of a response. I'll just read it because it, it answers it better than I could say. What did you gain by shouting Hindu Shaitan Zindabad? Kashmir's burning, Nagaland's burning, Manipur's burning, Punjab's burning. Seven southern states are ready to separate. 800 million Hindus have no proper sanitation or toilets in India. Every two minutes, there's a rape or a kidnapping in India. Gujaratis took all the money and ran abroad. The list goes on. 
There are also 45 to 50 countries globally which are landlocked. For example, Israel, Finland, Luxembourg, many more, all doing better than your... Well, I won't repeat the word because it's rude. But yeah. there's your answer. Now, Serenity then comes back and finally says, look, majority of those that want Khalistan live outside of India. Hypocrites. Well, again, and the, the, well, as of this, there was no response to this. But the, again, the response, and I'll respond if I may, on behalf of the community is saying, why do you think they live outside India? Because they're not allowed to campaign in India. If they do, they end up like Amrit Pal Singh in jail on trumped up charges under questionable legal grounds. There is no democracy in India. It is a fake democracy because they cannot campaign in the Punjab for Khalistan because they end up in jail. They can only do it in free democracies like Canada, like the US, like the UK, uh, uh, the Southern Hemisphere countries like Australia, New Zealand, etc. And in Europe, that is why they live outside. That is why they're having to hold the referendum outside of India, because if they hold the referendum in India, they will go to jail. Do you call that democracy? Unfortunately, Serenity, you need to watch our show more often. Please become a regular viewer of our show and you will understand. We will do our very best to educate you and lay out the truth of this. Why Afghanistan should be established, why it will succeed, etc. James, I think there's, there is every argument that we lay out on a, week, a daily basis, do we not? Absolutely, Angus. And I would even throw into that uh, that jail is probably the most pleasant thing you're going to get for speaking out against the uh, India government and trying to organize the referendum there. There's arranged disappearances, there's murders, there's torture. Uh, you know, how many of the uh, of the farm protesters were, quote, and unquote, you know, committed suicide when it may not have been so much at their own hands, in my opinion. So, you know, maybe not all of them, but I think there's a good number of them that were not so much self-inflicted, uh, you know, endings. Extra judicial killings, the method of choice of the Indian government through the last few decades. We do know that and we reported on it. Yeah. So, Serenity, as, as we say, thank you very much indeed for your comments. Uh, but we do hope that uh, by watching us and, and learning, you will understand why we believe Khalistan not just should be established, but why it will be a massive success as a nation. And I dare say there will be an open door to you to live there and live under their philosophy and their governance. And you will understand actually what a wonderful nation it will be to live in. But on that positive note, we will draw things to a close for another day and another week. But don't forget uh, that you can message us directly at message at satledgetv.com if there's anything you'd like to bring to our attention. And thank you, as always, for loads. There have been massive, masses of comments coming in. And as I say, too many for us to unfortunately talk about much as we would love to do so. But thank you. Do keep them coming. Do keep them educational. Do let us know what you think, your perspectives on a lot of the issues that we cover. And of course, keep those wonderful, critical, rude comments coming in. They're always, they're always good for a laugh and good for a bit of banter too. And we're, we're always happy to report on those. But in the meantime, James and I will bring the show to, another, to a close for another day. Thank you so much for watching. It is a goodbye from me and it is a goodbye from James. Stay safe, everyone. You have been watching Perspectives. We will see you next time.